Raised by Spirit, Chapter 6, Breaking Cycles with the Help of Spirit, Angels, and Ascended Masters. Once I decided to walk away from those that were associated from this instructor that shall not be named and her circus ring, I went down to the lake one day. I was trying to figure out, aside from offering readings, how could I approach this newfound purpose and make it something that's successful but also helps teach people. That day was when I was introduced to a new guide, whom I ended up naming Chief. When I saw him, he approached me at the lake slowly, but he was fully dressed in his native attire, all of which suggested he was Cherokee native. He never said anything to me. He would just point to things. He would follow me around and show up at random times to point out birds, triggering me to remember their association as messengers. He pointed out trees and plant medicine. He reminded me of all the traditions that I had learned of over the years from my grandmother. I couldn't quite understand at the time why he wasn't verbal and why he would just point to things. You might think to yourself, as I did, what an odd way to be a guide, right? After meeting him at the lake, he would pop in frequently, mainly when I sat down to write out the itinerary that I wanted to use to present to others in efforts to help them understand how each and every one of us has the ability to connect to the other side and how each and every one of us have the ability to heal ourselves. He would point out old notes that I had taken and channeled. He would appear when I would revisit highlighted areas in specific books and with his help I was able to formulate the itinerary connecting the spiritual, energetic, and scientific points of healing. With his help and his guidance, I was able to create the program that others would be able to relate to and understand, suggesting that spiritual healing is not entirely an unseen practice. I decided at this point I was going to categorize this lesson plan as Reiki, although it is far from any of the traditional teachings that I had read in regards to this Japanese form of healing, and we'll get to the details of that much later. Once I formulated an itinerary and I got my notes in order, the interaction with this particular guide became less and less, and he does pop up again much later, and we'll get there. I also decided that because tarot was something that helped me immensely when it came to understanding the guidance before things actually occurred, I decided to incorporate tarot into my readings. The first deck of cards I ever made was based off of that original playing deck that I taught myself off of years ago. I ended up laminating my first deck at Office Max. It was horrible, but it worked. Throughout the years, my tarot cards have gone through many cycles of rebirth, now produced professionally and available to others, but at the time, I worked with what I had. From day one, though, I've always allowed spirit to come through first during a reading. I allow them to say whatever it is that they want to say. Then after that, I'll do a small tarot reading. I found that in doing it this way, it helps validate things and allow a greater depth of understanding to come through in regards to what spirit was originally trying to say in the beginning. All of which is helpful, especially when it comes to the things they talk about that haven't yet happened. And even though I would never lie, most people don't know that about me the first time we meet. Some things that I've said throughout the years seem quite outlandish at the time, but it always is validated in time. As I started to provide readings for more and more people, little did I realize I had opened up the floodgates for more and more of their people's communication. I was used to how my people communicated with me, and I was in the process of learning that just like we all have our own personalities, so do those on the other side, including their own way of coming through. This was challenging in the beginning because some spirits would come through before their loved ones even reached out to me for a reading, which I didn't even realize was a thing, but apparently it was. More so, they started to come through and I would see other people's loved ones the way they died. Some would come through with a noose around their neck or mangled in a car accident and so on. Some were just lost souls that weren't necessarily connected to anybody in particular. Sometimes they were connected to property or they were just wandering and realized that I could see them. This was not at all what I was used to and all a little too much for me to handle at the time or so I thought. I remember at one point right around this time of starting to open up and read for more people, my bedroom specifically would become flooded with random dead people wandering around at night. This was bothersome to say the least. I tried to ignore it as much as possible. Unfortunately, that was not something I was able to do. I remember telling my husband about it and he was quite confused. I mean, most men are willing to do anything for their family, but what are you going to do when someone's struggling with an invisible problem? He didn't know how to help. 
So after about three nights of no sleep because of these random dead people walking around my bedroom, I started to feel like I was legitimately losing my mind. You've all been there in a situation where you're overtired and unable to think. Everything just becomes clouded. This was no different. I was tired. I had tried sleeping with the lights on, sleeping with the television on, or sleeping in another room, but nothing was helping. And my people weren't necessarily coming through to offer any advice. So after three days of not sleeping, when everybody was at work or school, I went into my bedroom and got my grandmother's blanket out. I sat on the side of the bed and basically summoned all my people. Mother God, Father God, my dad, John, Cora, Maggie, Orion, and Chief. All of them. Everybody that I knew to call upon. And I just sat there and cried and told them that I was willing to do whatever it took to pursue reading and relaying messages to help people, to teach people. But how the hell was I supposed to do that if I couldn't sleep and think clearly? I remember specifically saying that I had thick enough skin to be able to deal with the backlash and the stigma of being a psychic medium. However, I was absolutely not comfortable with random people coming around me that weren't connected to me even being able to help. I told them I wasn't comfortable seeing something so graphic and horrific like a car accident or someone hanging from a noose, and that I'd rather hear the word suicide or car accident if that was something that needed to be incorporated in a message. But I by any means didn't want to see anything like that ever again. And even though I was directing my conversation at all my people, nobody came through to validate anything for me at that moment in time, but I knew at the very least they heard me. So that night when I went to go to bed, I wasn't going to sleep in another room or with the lights on or with the TV on. Instead, I decided that I was going to take two small tea light candles and ask my people yet again to come into my bedroom and to help me sleep. I did this because I remembered throughout the day my grandmother used to tell me that spirits were attracted to natural light. That's why a lot of churches use candles or natives with ceremonial fires. In lighting those candles, I was again doing so to call my people in effort so that they would hear my call. And then I climbed into bed and I started to cry because I was fucking tired. No sooner did I shed those tears and four angels appeared before me, two at the bottom of the bed and two at the top. Now this was my first experience with an angel. Angels have an entirely different type of energy to them. They don't seem to be like our loved ones. Their personalities consist of peace and serenity. And that's pretty much the best way that I can explain it. I just felt a sense of complete peace and serenity that filled the room and then my entire body. And then I went to sleep. That night, I had a dream. In the dream, I saw myself laying in my bed and I observed my spirit lifting out of my body. After my spirit left the body, I was then experiencing the dream in the first person, and I walked over to my dresser and stood in front of the mirror. I had my arms stretched out, holding myself up, and my head face down. And before I knew it, Orion was standing behind me. He had to have been at least seven foot tall, and he wrapped his arms around me. Because he was so big, he literally engulfed me, again feeling the same thing, just peace and serenity. After that night, I never saw anything that I was uncomfortable seeing. Sometimes they don't answer us the way that we assume they will. However, they do indeed always answer our call. I also learned throughout this challenging time the importance of speaking your needs and placing boundaries, especially in the spiritual world. In the beginning of this pursuit, I knew damn well this was going to be a problem for my mother. To her, this was witchcraft and devil worship. Even though she herself had spiritual experiences beyond explanation, I pointed out that the Bible she loved so dearly was mainly based off of prophecies from dreams. I asked her how that was any different, and I asked her was I not also a child of God? I reminded her that it never was considered to be witchcraft or devil worship when my father came to visit her when he was sitting on the side of the bed or when he told her that he was at peace that night but somehow this was different because it wasn't her I couldn't begin to fathom how your own mother the one person in your life that is held to the expectation of loving you unconditionally because you are her child someone whom which you are made from turns out to only care about you under her own condition or only if you fit in her box of understanding. For now, let's just say, if I hadn't been raised by spirit, this experience with my mother and the generational cycles that needed to be broken could have had a very difficult and detrimental outcome. As I stated before, she would be the first to judge and this was no different. Again, I tried to explain to her on several different occasions that it was very similar to her pursuit of being a missionary and spreading God's word and the cycle therein. I reminded her of all the time Sometimes I did things that were guided by her grandmother, her mother, and my father, and how those situations occurred, even though I didn't tell her when I was young. I tried to help her see that I had always been this way. I tried to explain that some people call it God, some people call it the universe, or creator, or whatever. 
Some people don't have anything to do with it. And nonetheless, that it was all the same and I was just doing what she wanted to do, just in a different way. There was a long period of time where I tried to help my mother understand and accept me for who I was. Even though we struggled immensely with our relationship, I always did what I promised my father I'd do, and I took care of her to the best of my ability. As I mentioned before though, her paranoia would always get the best of her, and this was no different when it came to the apartments that she rented. Somehow she always got involved in religious debates with either neighbors or her landlord, inevitably leading to her moving. Again, when they didn't agree with her, they became jealous and evil and out to get her. And this happened on average about every two years, ever since my father had passed away. At one point, she was evicted from her apartment and didn't tell myself or my sister until she was left with three days to vacate the premises. When I received a phone call from my mother, I canceled all my appointments, all my parties, and all my classes and met my sister at my mother's apartment and began to pack her stuff up and bring her to my house to move in yet again. Now I knew damn well this was going to cause a lot of chaos. I worked out of my home at this point and the work that I did to provide for my family was one of the most unspeakable and evil things in my mother's eyes. But at the time, I figured we'd cross that bridge when we got there. I most certainly couldn't let my mother be out on the streets when I had the room to provide her a bedroom all of her own. She was reluctant to move in but didn't really have a choice. I tried to explain to her that it would be a good thing and she would be able to save money not having any bills or paying for any food. I figured I could cook for her and possibly help her out with her health. Again, because my mom didn't have a good understanding of nutritional value, she had developed diabetes throughout the years. My understanding of nutritional value, I thought I could help maintain a healthy way of living for her and help her save money until she became financially stable enough to move out somewhere else if she chose to. My sister and I didn't realize at the time how dementia and the unspoken of trauma we haven't yet addressed was slowly becoming a part of my mother's everyday experience. When I moved my mom into my house, my children were just about in their teens, and I noticed she would treat them as though they were babies. In my mind at the time, I assumed that she was just being a grandmother. I noticed that she would get extremely upset though when they didn't want to do the little kid things anymore, and she took it really personally. I tried to explain to her that they were teenage boys now, and they just weren't into certain things anymore, and it had nothing to do with whether or not they loved her. She struggled with the boys she loved so dearly growing up, and personally, I think she struggled with them growing into their own independence just as she struggled with me growing into mine. Mind you, I always encouraged my children to have a good relationship with my mom regardless of my relationship with her. I learned throughout the years, as you saw with John, that every relationship with someone is different and I was not going to take that away from them just because her and I had our differences. Unfortunately, a few years prior to my mother moving in, my youngest son and her did have a falling out. This falling out was because at the time he felt comfortable enough to talk to his grandmother about his friends at school, and at that point, some of his friends were coming out expressing that they were gay or lesbian or bisexual. Same-sex relationships were just as bad as everything she would accuse me of being. So when he told her about this, my mother went out and bought a dozen Jimmy Swagger Bible and gave them not only to my boys but also extras to give to their friends so they didn't rot for eternity in hell for being gay. Though my son did try to be respectful to his grandmother as he was raised to be, he didn't necessarily express his frustrations with his grandmother but he did tell myself and my husband that he was starting to see how she failed to see the good in other people. That she always picked fights with me about my profession and how his dad not believing in God was just as bad as all the above mentioned things. He said he didn't want to spend time over there anymore if that's how she was going to be. My youngest son from that point on became very distant from his grandmother. Even though I tried to explain to him maybe they could hang out and just avoid conversations to avoid arguing. Unfortunately, he, like myself, has zero tolerance and no poker face. So his detachment and disappointment was extremely clear to her from that moment on. But as I continued to work out of my house again after we moved her in, there were several occasions I had trying to explain to her that I was not participating in something evil. I would try in every way I could think of to help her understand and feel more comfortable with staying there but she never understood. She would either leave the house while I was doing a reading or lock herself in her room. It wasn't too long after I moved my mom in, maybe about two months or so, and that's being generous 
I was holding a tarot class. When I held class, I would gather 10 to 15 people in my kitchen and we would go over their individual abilities and how to connect it with tarot in that case. At some point that day, we took an intermission and I was standing outside smoking and I heard my grandmother say, she just went into the kitchen and saw what you were doing. No sooner than 10 minutes later, she walked out the side door where we all gathered with a suitcase. This was odd not only because she held a suitcase in her hand, but because she had previously avoided any contact with me or my guests at all costs. However, she was clearly trying to make a point. As me and my guests stood outside, she proceeded to put her suitcase in her car and scold everyone there saying things like she was not going to participate in this devil-worshipping cult. Although I was devastated and extremely embarrassed on the inside, I ended up finishing class that day after she left. And after class, I went into her bedroom to realize that she must have been packing everything up for a week or so because most of her belongings were gone. I tried to call her and she refused to answer the phone. I called my sister and tried to have her call her but she refused to answer. I didn't know if she was coming back or where she was going or if she was going to be safe. I was confused by the whole damn situation, but also by the fact that she left my father's ashes in the bedroom. She slept with his ashes by her nightstand every night, no matter where she was. So if she really moved out, why didn't she take his ashes with her? I struggled with this as the days went by and she was nowhere to be found. I didn't know what to do, so I took my father's ashes that remained in her bedroom and I sat down on the floor with them. I asked him to show me what to do, and all he showed me was a sword. The sword that he showed me was so bright that it actually had a blue hue all the way around it. And I remember asking, what the hell was that supposed to mean? but he didn't say anything. He just kept showing me this huge sword. Days that followed after I requested help from my father for some guidance on how to handle the situation, he was randomly making my cell phone shut off only for it to immediately reboot itself. Now at first, I didn't realize this was my father. I thought I just had a piece of shit phone. That is until I heard him say, look at the time. And no sooner did he say that, my phone shut off. So while I'm waiting for it to reboot so I can look at the time, I realized for about 10 seconds after my phone rebooted, it showed the time 2.35 on a futuristic date. The futuristic date it showed was October 29th, yet we were in the month of August. The second time it shut off and rebooted, again, the time showed 2.35, but the date showed November 8th. And the third time it did this, it wasn't on my phone, but my oldest son Jeremy's phone. Again, 2.35, and the date was December 8th. None of these dates made any sense to me. None of them held any significance in my life at that point. But my father, as I've stated before, will generally speak to me in riddles, and it's like putting pieces of a puzzle together in order to understand what his full message is. The following day, I intuitively received an address. When I looked up the address, I found that it was connected to a local motel. So, I drove by this motel, and to my surprise, there was my mother's car. I immediately called my sister to let her know that I found our mother staying at a local motel thinking that if I showed up at her doorstep with my father's ashes in hand, we could have a civilized conversation, so I went back to get my dad's ashes and bring them to her. When she opened the door, there was a look of surprise and astonishment on her face, perhaps for me finding her, but that was a brief moment of time. It quickly turned into a look of disgust. When I asked her why she was staying at a motel, she proceeded to accuse me of all the same things, irrationally and erratically. Things like witchcraft, devil worship, and so on. She threw in comments of how disappointed my father would be in me for treating her so badly. There were so many things that she rambled off that day that made no logical sense. Literally, nothing made sense. It was like she was living in the past, speaking about things that occurred 15 years ago like it was yesterday. However, this was also the day she verbally disowned me as her child. Possibly something she had wanted to say for a very long time, but never did. But I couldn't understand anything that was going on in her mind. So I left her with my father's ashes and left. Due to her disowning me, my sister then took over looking out for her and taking care of my mom from that day on. I was devastated and heartbroken. I knew that she had always had a hard time understanding me, but when she verbally disowned me, it was devastating. I came home, sat down at the kitchen table, and just cried in front of my whole family. I couldn't understand how she could do that. I could never do that to my children. There's nothing they could ever do or be 
that would make me ever love them less. It was throughout this time I began to have several encounters with ascended masters and archangels alike. Upon understanding the experience I'm about to explain, I had no prior knowledge of who Saint Germain was, not to mention how he was said to be connected in assisting souls break generational karmic cycles. As of 2022, as I sit here and write this out, this is something that just now is starting to grow in awareness. And keep in mind, when I say awareness, I mean it as to say our genetic makeup evolves and releases more information, helping humanity learn the lessons that are embedded within our genetic makeup, ancestry, and the divine design of life itself. As with everything, this isn't an instantaneous process. It's not as instantaneous as one might want it to be, because things always take time. One of the first interactions with an ascended master was at this crossroads in my life with someone known as Saint Germain. Now Saint Germain is also somebody who is referred to as Ezekiel through some texts, but because of how he introduced himself to me, I do prefer to call him Saint Germain. And like so many other experiences before, my introduction to him at this time of trying to navigate through my mother's disownment began in a dream. In the dream, I was in the middle of what looked to be like Arizona or Colorado desert. I was literally on a ranch. And there was this woman, whom which I knew in real life, standing by a fence, pointing off into the distance. When I looked to see what she was pointing at, there was a beautiful seven foot tall man approaching me. He had very light blonde hair and he glowed a violet purple color. As he approached me, he said absolutely nothing. He just took my hands and placed them in a trough. When he took my hands out of it, my hands were jagged, rough amethyst crystals. And as usual, that was it. I woke up. About a week later, I was helping the same woman that was in that dream put together a book sale for the community. As I was helping her organize the books, I came across a box filled with these green books. I asked her what she wanted to price them at and where she wanted them placed, to which she just said they can go in the free pile. And I thought to myself, well shit, if they're free, let me take a look, see if there's any that I want. And this is where it gets interesting. The very first book that I picked up and opened read the following. In offering a tribute of love and gratitude to our beloved Archangel Michael and the great angelic host who has assisted all mankind throughout centuries, we give all we are, have, or ever hope to be, or have, into the service of the light forever. In 1938, Philadelphia, our beloved Archangel Michael, in his very first channeling within these books, said the following, I had not ministered to earth since my ministry in France. I ministered then to the same individual who, this night, I began to minister through in America, our beloved Joan of Arc. I feel that it is my duty to do what I can do to assist the earth and the people who have turned to the light and stand firm and unyielding in the power of which I shall give them. In moving among them, they shall wield the sword of the blue flame in their physical hands. The paragraph went on to read, Everywhere you draw forth this fiery Christ blue lightning victory of sacred fire love of the angelic host, you can have that drawn forth in and around you as a permanent focus of the sacred fire in your own atmosphere. As this will increase throughout habit and you gain momentum, the light becomes brighter and the sacred sacred fire concentration of invincible victory becomes the greater pressure around you to repel destructive forces, and as time goes on, it becomes the illumination in the atmosphere about you, by which you can see into the Ascended Master's octave, and it can also become the illumination of the pathway ahead of you. As I sat on this porch and read these paragraphs, connecting them to what my father was trying to show me with this sword he kept giving me. I knew that I had to have these books, so I took them and put them in my truck immediately. Once I had time thereafter to sit down and actually take a look into these books, I quickly realized that they were the accumulation of channeling Saint Germain and Saint Michael and so many others. I ended up flipping open to pages that had pictures of Saint Germain and to my surprise it was exactly the same man that came to me in that dream and turned my hands into amethysts. Looking further into Saint Germain thereafter, not only is he connected with the amethysts and the violet color that was in my dream, but also he's connected directly to helping people break generational, genetic, and karmic cycles and so began communication with higher beings.